Good morning, everyone. Praise God. Good to see people back. Amen. I, I think I shared with you, you know, strange things happen, guys. Eyes forward. See if you ignore God. Are you a fool or what? Listen carefully. Everybody listen. I just want to get you attuned to prophecy. The worship was going on in Dublin, right? It's about 15 years ago. And in the middle of the worship, I get a word from the Lord that there's a child called Joshua whose top of his head is going to be removed in surgery. I could see it. And I want you to get up there, Mike, and I want you to pray for this child called Joshua who's having brain surgery right now. And the girl from UCB, a friend of mine, was leading the worship. So I said, Kelly, because shh. I said, let's all pray for Joshua. It's a child. I can see him. And I didn't think anything of it. So the next week, I had a meeting with the superintendent of Assemblies of God, Gary Davidson, in Dublin. And he said, how was your Sunday? I said, it was quite strange. In that moment of worship, I saw a child called Joshua having an operation, a brain operation. And we all prayed. He nearly fell off his chair. And he said, Jerry, Joe Fitzgerald's son, Joshua, was having an operation on his brain last Sunday. In during the meeting at 12 o'clock, just at the time. And the child lived. And the next major national celebration, he shared that testimony to the whole of the churches in the nation. You've got to be careful with prophets. You've got to be careful about ignoring people. You've got to be careful about warnings. Careful, guys. Be careful. Can you agree? Hmm. That was a reluctant agreement. You need to listen. You need to listen. God is a good God, isn't he? That's where you get a warning. Because he's a good God, he gives loads of warnings. But woe to you, woe to you, if you ignore those warnings, my friend. Woe to you. Jesus, I could stand here for a long time telling you people who have ignored me. A long time. I, I am bamboozled, gobsmacked. That's why I always obey my leaders, because I've experienced both sides of this. I've seen people die, literally, and I've seen the success of those who obey their leaders. So for me... Prophets I respect. Amen. Amen. I'm a great service leading, better than you think, perhaps. Very accurate prophetically there. Emma said we're running out of time. Remember? Got to get on with it because we're running out of time. We've been doing a series on minimalism. We began with food. Stuffing our face with everything. Is that wise? No. No. Eating anything that people give you, not being mindful of the documentaries that warn us about the contents, and we don't have time to go into it, but you would be shocked, as I have been shocked with some of the research I've done. So I'm going to be careful with what I eat. We looked at possessions. Our lives get choked up. Jesus said that. Choked up with the things of this life, buying stuff and all the rest of it, and how minimalism was Solomon's end result, you know? The rich man, he said, can't sleep because he lies in bed at night thinking about money and debts and this and that and the other, correct? So a simple life is better. I was talking to Michael, UCB contacted us this week about this series. They want us to go up and do an interview. Um, and it's a strange request, to be honest, because we go out to tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands a month. Um, so here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Why this series, huh? Do you know why? Because most of the preachers are talking about getting as many possessions as you can. Right? And something's going out that contradicts the trend of prosperity preaching. And someone up there thought, that's interesting. Jesus led a simple life. But most pastors are about gaining. I'm sorry, just telling you the truth, guys. It's the age in which we live. Hallelujah. <laughs> so simplicity in my possessions is the type of life that Jesus lived. Very, very simple life. And that's the one I must follow. We looked at our relationships and how complicated, my Lord, we could spend a lot of time on that. But today's thought is minimalism in my time. 
And goodness knows we haven't got a lot of time. <coughs> Just like possessions can clog my life, things can take your... Things can occupy your... Yeah. And they're not things that God gave you. I did a lot of research on this. Let me use MSNBC in America. They did categorizations. <coughs> it's hay fever, sorry. They did categorizations on the average lifetime breakdown. Look at this. They put 70, which was the Bible's thing. You're going to live probably three score years and ten. Uh, the majority of you will not. I'm just telling you the truth. The majority of you will not live three score years and ten because the, the, the average is below that. Okay? Uh, but they use this as an average. So for me, that's around 20 years maximum that I've got left. A very serious thought. So they took 70 years. So you've got 70 years. Of, look at this. The first 15 are gone because of childhood. You're in school. So you're not really doing anything. Then you sleep, some of you more. You sleep for 20 years, right? That's a long nap. 20 years gone in sleeping. They estimate globally that you're unfit. And I've been thinking about my relatives who have died recently. You're not physically fit enough to do anything for approximately five years of your life. I think of Ray Belfield. About 10 years of his, uh, the, what remained of his life, he was not fit to do anything. So you're left with 30, but look at the next point. For me, this part's not really that interesting because it's automatically deducted, like tax. It's gone. You don't have it in your wage packet. You don't have it in your time. The reality is, it's around the 30 mark that I've actually got to spend. It's actually 30 years. And of that 30 years, uh, MSNBC said some people spend up to 11 years watching TV. Goodness me. The average person waits in a queue 1.8 years. Bunk the queue. Get out of my way, right? 1.8 years waiting. Just waiting. On the tube, on the bus, on a taxi. Waiting. Heavens above. Shopping was eight years, I think. But... As I declutter, <coughs> as I declutter my possessions, this part, I repeat, is deducted anyway. But I don't want this part to be cluttered. Ah. If I understand that I've only got 30, am I going to spend 11 watching telly? No. You're going you're to do the calculations very, very differently, and I hope with insight. And that's what I want to talk about today. I've done as anybody does, bedside experiences, you know? When, uh, I mean, death, deathbed experiences, where you're with someone who's walked with the Lord all their lives, and you have uh, private conversations with many people. And one of the things you walk away from those occasions is this. Trajectory. Trajectory. People talk about what they did 30 years ago, and I'm, I'm listening to their story. I'm thinking, why didn't you change your... Why didn't you make a different decision at that point? Why are you telling me now? Well, you see, I got married to this person, and then, or I, I, I took this job, or I moved to this place, and I can hear the regret. Trajectory. The, 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 the direction of their life was a little bit off, but they didn't correct it. And now when they're dying, 30 years, 40 years are gone, and I walk in, and they're like, Pastor, do you know what? I'm lying in this bed all night. And as I think back, that was the mistake. I had a moment there to, to make a choice. On your notes, I've given you my three. This is just my opinion. Education, geography, and associations and loyalties. Number one, education. I got saved. I had no education. Absolutely nothing. I was an academic failure. But the first thing I did was get myself a biblical education. Why? Because I'm going to follow God. Eyes forward. What's your trajectory? Where are you going? And what are you doing to hit that goal? Where are you going? So as soon as I got saved, I was going somewhere completely different. I was successful in social services, Janet. Successful. I loved it with a passion. Loved it. Mental health. I passionately cared about it. But once I was saved... I, I had no education. So the first thing I did was I got that education. Michael and Doreen, when I came to London first, met him. 
You know, just a quiet chat. What's your trajectory? Michael's not happy, deeply unhappy. He shared his story with me. Being a teacher in London is not easy. What, what's your plan? Need an education. What do you want to do? Mental health. Get yourself an education. So Michael goes to college. Point two, geography. <laughs> Where's it going to be, Mike? What, how's that going to work? Is it going to be here? And he started praying and started thinking. Right? It's important. For me, those things kicked right. Once I got my education, and I can almost see it now, it's almost like God just accepted a day when, okay, come, you know. My calling came to me. People came to, to employ me. I didn't have to knock anybody's door because I'd done my homework. I'd been diligent and, and, and true to my own thing. I didn't even go to my own graduation because I disrespected what they were trying to make me into something that I'm not. So I rejected it. I believe God saw me do that. I believe he saw me do that. I never had to promote myself. Didn't have to do it. Get yourself an education for God's sake. Not anybody else's. For God's sake. Hallelujah. Think about the geography because your, your, your calling is connected to geography. Your giftings, I'm not talking about gifting. You're all gifted. But the calling is geographic. Do you understand that? Calling is a place, not a gift. Your gift is not your calling. Your honey, you're up here leading worship. That's not your calling. It's your gifting. Your calling is London. There's a difference. And people live their whole lives thinking, I'm operating in my calling. No, you're not. You're geographically wrong. And that's why you've been stuck for the last 20 years. Father, I pray that the people hearing this will understand this in Jesus' name. You need to get the geography right. And then you take your gift and you use that gift on location. And then thirdly for me, associations and loyalties. I was part of a group that was not a good group. I'm just telling the truth. I'm not going to name it. It was a Christian group. I was one of their ministers. <laughs> but as soon as I got saved and got educated, I, changed my, I just knew this is not the DNA for me. There's stuff here that's not good and I'm not going to be party to it. So to their shock, I resigned, and I joined VFC, and I changed my association, and I changed my loyalties to something that I could trust, that was an ethical, moral, biblical oversight structure and fatherhood for me. Can you say amen? amen. So you consider, as you think about your life's trajectory... Where are you going? Do you have the education required for that destination? Where is it going to be geographically? And who are you going on the journey with? For me, it was Rick, 22 years together. You need to get your associations clear. So in terms of minimalizing my time then, or bringing that in as a concept and ethos into my life management, the do's and don'ts of lifetime management. Number one on don'ts for me... <coughs> <clears throat> is motives. God is not interested in what you do, correct? He's interested in why are you doing that? Why do you want that? My motives are very important. As I talk with people, often those who are dislocated or disappointed with their lives, listen to them, read between the lines. Many people do things, and you know the hidden motive? I'll show them. I'll show them. They said I couldn't do it. I'll show them. They said I'd never make it. I'll show them. My family said I'll show them. Back show them. What's the motive? I'll show them. And many people live their lives with their almighty bitterness to something someone said. That's an appalling motive, but it is absolutely true. I could give you a rattle off a list of things right now of people over the years that have tried to correct on this issue. Say, don't move on from them. Don't let them be your motive. Let God be your motive. The second thing that I wouldn't want to do, hey, listen carefully, don't spend your time trying to justify yourself to go driven 
Don't build an ego-driven church, an ego-driven ministry, because one day, what's going to happen in that church? Okay, I'll tell you. It's going to come tumbling down. If you, that's what Hezekiah did. Remember Hezekiah? Built a great big facade, invited everybody in to see it, showed them all around what he had done. What happened to him? You're going to die, Hezekiah, right? Because he was what driven? Ego-driven. Ego-driven. So in your ministry, in your career, in your life, don't be ego-driven. Because there's no morals. People driven by ego have no morals. They will do anything they need to do to achieve the goal that makes them look good. Don't let your ego drive you. It's a bad driver. It's a bad master. Ego makes compromises that morality will never do. If you're driven by God, you will operate in the principles of God and biblically, right? If you're driven by your ego, you're not going to care less about those principles. You will trash them to achieve a greater image in the eyes of people. Amen. Amen. So do's and don'ts of my time management, which is so short, Emma. So short. So I'm going to take good stock of it. I'm not going to be driven by, I'll show them. I'm not going to be driven by my ego and build something that's not, it's a facade and morally underneath it, it's corrupt. That's hopeless. That's terrible. I'm not going to do that. Number two. Spending your time wanting what other people have. Solomon mentions this in Ecclesiastes. He says, better is what is in your sight. Better is the relationships you have than the ones you don't have. Work on them. Okay? Eyes forward. Enjoy your family. The one you've got. Okay? Stop looking at other people. Stop looking at what they have. I wish I had what. And they're not even enjoying the moment. Your time is, is ticking every day whilst you're looking over the neighbor's fence. Trying to acquire more, to be more, whatever that is. Solomon's correct. Better is what you've got than to let your heart be stolen and, and, and glancing at everybody's life and trying to be something that you're not. Amen. Had this beautiful girl come down an altar call one day. <coughs> she came walking towards me. This was in Glasgow. We had many, 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 many students. And she was about 20. And as she came, she was a Chinese girl. And as she came down, I just said, hello. And I looked in her eyes and she got blue eyes. <laughs> Hallelujah. How did that happen? I was thinking, okay, let me just oh, look again. Definitely a blue-eyed Chinese girl. Okay, and I've worked for Singapore for many decades, and I, I have never seen one of you. And I suddenly realized, you got contact lenses in. <laughs> got colored contact lenses in. You don't like who you are. And as I sat and talked to her, it just became incredibly apparent everything was being done to be somebody else. What's that for? Who, this creation, this Frankenstein that you're going to create, what's, who's that for? You're on the wrong road there, girl. Amen? You're on the wrong road there. You need to come right back. Don't waste your life trying to be someone else. Rejoice in who you are. The person God made you to be, whatever that is and however that is, accept yourself in that sense. Amen? And rejoice. And if you rejoice in yourself, other people will rejoice in you too. So number one, motives. Cleanse those motives. Number two, wanting what other people... Don't waste your time in covetousness of material possessions or other things. Rather, be happy with what God has graced you with and granted you with. <coughs> and then again... I just want to go back over the associations and loyalties. I am not a member of a political party. Okay? It's up to you if you want to be. Okay? But for me, as I look at they want me to sign something or vote for something, as I look at what's happening in Parliament, I, I, I'm compromised. I don't know if I can sign that document. What's the Lib Dem? Tim Farron? Tim Farron, the leader of the Liberal Democrats in the UK. He's a born-again Christian. He was, that's right, thank, thank you. He was the leader 
But when the homosexual uh, laws came in, Tim Farron came out very brave. He's a lovely person. Came out in public and said, look, I'm a, I'm a born-again Christian. And they're asking me to sign this and sign that. I can't do it because of my faith and how I believe. So with great regret, I'm stepping back from my leadership of his lifetime career, right? He says, look, his associations and loyalties had to change in order for him to get to heaven. People die every day, my friend. <laughs> Are you prepared? Just watch those loyalties. Watch it. Look, if I give a thumbs up on Facebook to something, do you know what that says? I endorse you. I support you. I, I endorse, I mean, as far as the viewer sees, I endorse everything you are. I'm behind this. So you want, you want to be well careful about your thumbs up. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Be mean with your thumbs up. Hold on to those thumbs a moment. And just make an assessment of what you're endorsing. Oh, yeah. Careful. Associations and loyalties with my culture. I covered that a few weeks ago. I've got no cultural loyalty whatsoever. Zero. I don't believe in it. I have a passport to a higher place. I'm a citizen of, a, of the kingdom of my God, which has no color, no race, nothing. I'm up there. Where are you? <laughs> Where are you? Associations and loyalties. Get the loyalty right. Get the loyalty right. And denominations or churches or whatever. I've got no affiliation. I have zero loyalty to VFC. Absolutely nothing in me to LFC, to this church. Zero for me. Okay? I will serve the Lord my God. Okay? It's very important, guys. Get your loyalty in the right place. Get your loyalty in the right place, where it belongs. Are you saved? Yes. Where is your loyalty? Up there or down here? Is it in your culture? Is it in human relationships? Is it with God and God alone? It had better be. It had better be, my friend. Don't play games with this. Get your loyalty to God. Get, don't play games with salvation. I will never serve my culture or a political party. I'm not a politician. I'm a pastor. Politicians do whatever they want. I can't do that. Because I'm a pastor. has to live by biblical ethics in my life. Many of you also pastors. So you understand how it works. The don'ts with my short little brevity of time. Man, Easter family camp. Heavens above. I was out yesterday. I was getting some Christmas decorations for my apartment, you know. Getting some presents. Just joking. Just joking. <laughs> but don't you hear people say, is it 12 o'clock already? Huh? What is it, September? Are you kidding me? Actually, actually, I'm not joking because doesn't it feel like yesterday we were at Easter camp? Don't know how you know, time's elastic, you know. Time and space are the same physical object. I don't understand how this works. I haven't, haven't figured that out like anybody has. Einstein got close. It says that uh, in Daniel, knowledge and things will increase in the last days. They said that there's, like an elastic band, when you let it go, there's kind of a speed up something. I don't, can't quite get my head around that. But things are moving very fast. Very, 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 very fast. And lastly... Under the don'ts for my time, I want to declutter my time. I'm going to purify my motives. I'm not going to be driven by my ego. I don't want to want what other people have got. I'm going to sanctify my associations and my loyalties as a, as a pastor and as a born-again biblical believer. And I'm not going to live in the past and the things I've been or done. Some of you have made big mistakes. Big, big, big mistakes. You've done things that you shouldn't have done. Haven't you? <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Yes, you have. You've done things you shouldn't have done. Been involved in things you should never, ever have been involved in. You know the Apostle Peter? 
That's what he was like. He denied Christ, compromised his own ethics. He ends up crying in a doorway. And Peter is saying, did I just do that? Was that really me that just did? did was that me? Was that really me? But you know what? God gave him another chance, didn't he? And today, today, this day in Jesus' name, I pray that you think again about what motivates you. You think again about what drives you. You think again about loyalties, about churches, about all of these things. And you sanctify areas of yourself perhaps that you've never gone to before. Amen? Amen. Why? Because the time is short. Time is short. Very, very short. Shorter than you think. I drove to Glasgow with Ray Belfield. He was about 77 years old. He'd been in ministry for decades, hadn't he? Long time in ministry. And I remember his old wrinkled body on the steering wheel. He was driving like a kamikaze pilot. I mean, he's okay. He can die because he's he's way up in years. I was like, slow down. Slow down. He's a crazy driver. And he's driving. He said, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. He was a crazy driver. But all those years in ministry, I'll never forget in that journey, one thing he turned to me and he said, Mike, you don't look back. I haven't got time to look back. Look at me. Mike, don't look back. Just, just don't look back. And he had been the, the, all over the newspapers because of miracles that had been performed in his church. He'd, he'd uh, been very famous at one point. Uh, 21 years superintendent of Assemblies of God in the UK, pastor of the largest church in the United Kingdom. Now he's an old man who nobody knows, driving a car like a crazy person. And he's, he's, he's down, down the motorway. And he turns to me and he says, Mike, I must not try and live up, live up to what I've been. I've always got to press ahead. Can't look back at the thing I did or talk about what I did. I did this and I did that. You've got to keep looking forward, Mike. Always look forward. Good piece of advice, isn't it? Do you know he went on to serve the Lord for another 10 years? Died serving the Lord. Died employed at 87 last year, two years ago. Amen. And this was his advice. Don't dwell on your past victories or glories. Don't dwell on your past defeats. But look forward, get the, make the trajectory your goal, and get that from God. That's the don'ts. <coughs> what about the do's? Well, in Ephesians, Paul gives a, a great little piece of scripture there. In Ephesians 5, verse 14 to 17, it's a great scripture because he begins by talking about, Wake up, O sleeper, so that the light of God will, will dwell on you. And, <coughs> Excuse me. He talks about many things about my time, my life, and how I'm using my life. Now, eyes forward, please. Listen, the Apostle Paul is talking to you about your life, where you're going, and how you're spending your time. Do you know the first thing he says? <laughs> Wake up! Wake up! You're sleepwalking through this life. Who gave you that agenda? Don't you real like a Bill Gates moment where Bill Gates was in college, wasn't he, studying, and uh, he and the other guy. It's like a eureka moment. What am I doing here? And out they go. I mean, John Wesley did the same thing. John Wesley in Bible College, straight through the door. Because something came over him. He understood the moment. He woke up. And I pray for you today that you will wake up. Amen. Amen? And see the shortness of this time. So Paul says, wake up, O sleeper. How can you sleep? How can you sleep? That's his first point. By the way, let me say this. You need to sleep. (laughs) Because sleep is important. Some of you don't get enough sleep. And if you don't sleep, you get fat, like me. If you don't sleep, it's not a good policy. So that's not what Paul's saying. Get proper sleep. Amen. However, wake up to my kingdom choices. Wake up to what, I, you know, what God has for me. That's his second point. Choices. He says, be very circumspect in some versions. Be very wise about the choices that you make. Amen? Amen. Women, Sandra. I love the Proverbs 31. 
woman. You know Proverbs 31? And all the women hate that woman, right? Don't you? Because she does everything right. The Proverbs 31 woman. Do you know what it says about her choices? It says this. She views a field and she buys the field. But in the Amplified, taking it from the Hebrew, do you know what it says? But she, she adds to her life that which does not compromise her existing responsibilities. Whoa. There's a wise choice. So this is a woman. Women are responsibility takers. This is a woman who, before she makes a choice, she considers, I've got to look after my husband. I've got to look after my kids. I've got to do it. Before she makes a choice, she considers her existing responsibilities. And then she views and she adds. Amen. Amen. Very good piece of advice. Consider those choices. Wake up, consider my choices. And he says, be wise, do not be foolish. I need my son to come here someday. My stepson, I don't have any children. They're Jeanette's children. James, he, he oh God, he's making money, I tell you. He's changed jobs about four times in seven years. Uh, he's got simple, just got a law degree, simple law degree. Who, it's, it's not, I mean, that's quite common. There's nothing special about that. But he's making a fortune. One thing I'll say for James, he's such a humble boy, so sweet nature, humble, humble boy, very likable. But I meet him about every four months, and he tells me of what he does. I don't understand what he does for a living. He talks blah, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. But listen, then he turns, and this is the important part. This is the wise part, uh, because he, he does this about every third or fourth time we meet. What do you think? And it's the way he looks at me. Advise me. And it's the humility, the brokenness within him. Tell me what to do. And I remember a few jobs back, I said, James, quit this. Leave this. Leave it. Leave it. And obviously, he's grown up with me. He's seen the result of prophecy many times. I said, leave, leave it. Leave it. Okay. Okay. And do what? I don't know. <laughs> Just leave it. So he goes, okay, leave that part to me. Yeah. And off he goes. And next thing, he's you know, up a quarter of his salary. Then he's doubled his salary. He's flying. Absolutely flying. Never compromised his principles. He does it. He's a very, very straight guy. Very straight guy. So be wise. Amen. Be wise with your time. Be wise. Take counsel. Amen. Take counsel. Be humble. Amen. Paul says, seize every opportunity because the days are evil. I, I, I'm not going to mention this anymore. I'm going to mention it one more time. And then for the rest of my life, I'm not going to use this example. Because I've got a bee in my bonnet about this example. I told you. I, I, I need to get over it. I wanted this guy to go full time. I brought Rick in to meet him, sat him in the office, and while Rick was still in the office, the guy walks out and says, who does he think he is? I'm not going full time. I thought, come, come back, come back. Such a good guy. And Rick comes out of the office, and I said, well, we'll give him another go. Give him another chance in a few months' time. And Rick said, Mike, you've got to accept something. That guy will never enter ministry. I'm just telling you. Now, that was how many? 20 years ago, something like that, that was. And I did not believe Rick. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. Listen carefully now, because this is important. Jesus put it like this. If you put your hand to the plow, and then you turn back, I will not come back to you, right? You're, you're not worthy of the calling that has been offered to you. Let me put it like this. Jesus is in front of me, and Jesus speaks to me. Mike, I want you to do that. I've got my hand to the plow. And Jesus speaks to me. Mike, I want you to... I had a word right, the church, the, the book, um, Planting Churches in the Last Days. Had that word in the middle of worship. Gave me the whole structure standing there. So I'm speaking to him. God speaks to me, Mike, this is what I want you to do. And I say, okay, Jesus, just hang on whilst I confer with my friends. I'm not going to confer with nobody. It was only a joke. Hallelujah. Listen, 
when God gives you a word, you be careful to obey that word. You okay? It's okay. Okay, Ray? When God gives you a word, be very careful about, you know, go, there, there, there's a time and place for consultation. But the person who puts their hand to the plow and then says, I just need to get that people agree with you, God, you're on the wrong road. And what this guy did that day is he turned, out, turned around. It was about 15 years later. He actually emailed Roy and he said, I made a big mistake that day. And I like the guy. But today he works in an office. Morning, morning, morning. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Morning, morning. Sleep, morning. See you tomorrow. Morning. See you Monday. Okay. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah. Slept most. My point is, the Apostle Paul says, you need to watch the opportunities. You need to watch the opportunities. Because, and this is the part I don't like, because when you put your hand to the plow, and God gives you a word, and you dare turn to people, that's the problem. People have their place. No problem. I've worked with people all my life. Just don't put people above God. So when he calls you and an opportunity comes your way, make sure that you follow that opportunity. Be ready for the moment at any cost. Be ready for that moment. Thank you for praying for Mary's visa. And thank you for the women. I know many of you women are in communication with her constantly. And I thank you for that encouragement. She appreciates it. But when God spoke to me to ask her to marry me, I sent her that when she was asleep. So she was asleep in Colombian time. Now, let me tell you something about the way prophecy works, at least for me. I sent that text to her because that's what I had to do because of the time difference. And I went to a church down in Holborn, which has a coffee shop. Got a cup of coffee, went up in front of everybody, and I just knelt down on the, at the altar, which was all gated off, and I knelt down. It was very serious, you see. And my conversation with God was this. My yes is yes, and my no is no. So I've just given this girl an opportunity. If the reply comes through to me now, and she says, I need time to think about it, maybe, or anything else, I'm finished. Okay? If anyone puts their hand to the plow and turns away, they're not worthy of this. It's the wrong person. Consider, you consider today the goodness and the severity of God. So when God said, ask her, that she's, she's it's a long story. I, I'm recommending you marry this girl. So I sent her that text. I got down on my knees in fear and trembling because I don't know what the answer is going to be. But if she says maybe, that's no. For me, it's a no. And I was very stressed. A few hours went by, two blue ticks. You know, two blue ticks. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And I'm going to finish this story next week. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, I'm waiting. And then the answer came through very important for me. Very important. Because believe me, it's a no for me. So the answer came through and she simply said, very simply, the answer for me is yes. But you understand that I obey my parents. And I obey my church. So for me, yes. But you must understand my culture and my morality. You must come through my parents and my church. Is that a good answer or what? That's a 10 out of 10 answer. That's 100%. Because any girl who doesn't respect her parents ain't going to respect you, lad. And if she's not going to obey her existing leadership, if she's not going to obey the authority that is existing over her, that is a rebellious heart. Oh, I'll come and I'll be obedient to you, but I'm not going to obey my existing authority. You're on an unbiblical ground. Let me hear a big amen. amen. Careful. So she got all her ducks in a row. Have you? Time is short. Oh, 
Jesus. I have made a lot of mistakes in my life. I have never claimed to be Mr. Goody Two Shoes. Hallelujah. Would you laugh? <laughs> I have never claimed that. That would be a false claim. Totally false claim. I'm no angel. Archangel Michael, right? I'm no angel. But I try. But one thing I'm happy with in retrospect is my choices. I'm not sad about that. As I look back, I did good choices because I was always seeking God's will. And today, in this day, in Jesus' name, enough time wasted. Enough time wasted. Today, this morning in this place, what's your next step? What's your next step? I plead with you, get this one from God. Maybe you didn't get the last one from God. Maybe you invented it. Maybe you didn't get the one before that from God. But the next one, today, will you get it from God? For your ministry, get that from God. If you're single, for your marriage or for your existing marriage, take your partner and go back to God and get it from God. For your career, for your family. I say that because in Ephesians 5, Paul he says, wake up, make good choices. And the last thing he says is, in accordance with God's will. Get yourself into the center of God's will for your life. Pat, good morning. Did you have a good holiday? (laughs) I saw you in a vision there when I was preparing this message. I was praying for her, for a husband, for her, you know. Any volunteers? Just joking. (laughs) And this is what, this this is what I saw. So within two weeks of wanting to get married, God brought me Mary. I'm not saying that's the same for everyone. But I'm saying... There's protocol in heaven. There's protocol. And see when I need a word or I need God's intervention. I've used the same technique for years and years. Never has failed me yet. So when I need help, I'm afraid the watch has to come off. The TV goes off. Uh, Lock Chrissy in a cupboard or something. (laughs) And I'll take my seat. And you know who's boss here? Not time. And I will wait. I don't care how long I have to wait. And I will stay. And I'm warning you, Pat, listen to this next piece of advice. As I sit, I'm asking for A. Fasting and praying day one, day two. And suddenly I get a word, but it's not about A. God will speak to me and say, I want you to go and apologize to this. That's got nothing to do with why I'm here. I just fasted for four days to hear that. You know the story. you got to go out and put something right because something's not right. And then you come back. Now, you've just taken one step by, by being obedient. And you get into the place where those times for me are short and long. Sometimes they're long if something's wrong. It's a long time, 400 years of silence because something was wrong. Jesus. So David talks a lot about this secret place, a place where you, I'm talking about God's will for your business, your career, your marriage, your min, all of it. Get into the place where he is your Lord. Hallelujah. He is your Lord. And don't compromise that. And I just saw that. I saw you beginning a discipline. A time where you'll take time and let God begin to meet you. Thank you. And not just her, but for all of you as well. Time is short. Jesus. going to invite the worship team back. Just take a moment, guys. Bow your heads.
Just stay in this gracious, gracious moment with a very kind God who loves you and wants the best for you. And Lord, we, we happily acknowledge that we've made many decisions in our own strength, many decisions that we regret, and we say, sorry, Lord. But on this very day, we invite you to come and sit with us, to be our guide for our marriages, present and future, for our careers and our businesses, present and future, for our ministries. Come and be Lord. And when we put our hand to the plow, I pray you will give us the grace and the courage not to shrink back, not to be afraid, but to trust you to step out of the boat. Emma, would you prepare yourself to pray for us as a church? I pray for the time factor, God, that we will waste no more time wanting what other people have, wanted to be seen. God, deflate my ego in Jesus' name. Destroy my ego and let me seek only your glory in this life. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us this afternoon. We thank you for your word. We thank you for calling us back to your will. Father, we say we surrender to you this afternoon as a judge. Father, we give up ourselves, our egos. Father, things we want to do and the motives for which we do them trying to prove a point to others Father forgive us help us oh God to make you our goal to make pleasing you our target and that alone we surrender to you we say Lord help us oh God help us to wake up Lord as a church help us to be careful how we live oh God help us to be wise oh God Help us as individuals consider our choices, Lord. Help us to seek every opportunity to honor you. Father, we pray that in our lives, Father, in our ministries, in our careers, Father, in our marriages, and even those that are called to be single, Father, we pray that we'll honor you. We say your will be done in our lives, Lord. Father, we say, let this word be deeply rooted in our lives, in our hearts. Holy Spirit, cause us to remember it constantly, that we'll walk in step with you, always honoring you, always giving glory to you, always pleasing you and no man. We thank you that our loyalties and our associations will be towards you and you alone. You'll be our God and nobody else. We thank you, O oh God, and we give you praise that you hear us because we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.